Hi, my name is Zoe Blade and today I'd like to talk to you about the tantalizingly named Bucket Brigade device. Uh, I've got two of those uh, behind me right here. There's one, there's the other one. Uh, there's a few effects you can get for uh, synthesizers and out of them I think uh, the Bucket Brigade device is one of the most uh, electronic of all of them. Whereas the uh, Spring Reverb uses physics and the tape delay uses magnets and, and tape storage for a very small amount of time. But still. Um, this uses just capacitors uh, as far as I understand it. Um, the way I believe bucket brigades originally work is uh, when you're putting out a fire and you haven't got a hose pipe you'll get uh, a bucket and you'll pass it to the person next to you and then you'll get another bucket pass it to the person next to you and the bucket gets passed along down the line from each person to the next and out pops the other end where a firefighter chucks it on the water. And basically that's what a BBD does with uh, electricity which gets stored in a capacitor and then discharges, gets stored in the next one and, and gets passed along. And with this one, it's got 1024 filled in, it's got 1024 capacitors in a row which is uh, two and then double it and double it and uh, I think ten times, uh, so it's two to the power of ten. Uh, and this one's got 4096 so you double it again and again and that's how many capacitors are in that one. And all that means is uh, an audio signal goes into it and then a short while later it comes back out again uh, having been through all the capacitors. And the theory is that the capacitors don't really change it that much. What goes in is what comes out. All you're doing is delaying the signal slightly. But in practice uh, it's not quite perfect as we'll, we'll find out more on that later. So um, yeah, that's it basically. Uh, signal goes in and a short while later signal comes back out theoretically pretty much untouched and uh, so let's go ahead and, and explore it and uh, see how it works and what it does. I've wired up a very basic patch uh, which just plays uh, a very uh, simple sawtooth wave. I mean, there's nothing really especially interesting about that. It's just a sawtooth wave that's very short and that's going through this here delay which is the, uh, the longest of the two because it's got more capacitors in it. So what I'll do, no, that's, that's not a scratch, that's fine. All right, so what I'll do is I'll uh, mix in more of the delayed version and less of the original. So this is the original signal. And if we add in a bit more of the delay, you can hear there's another copy of the sound that starts a bit later, which gets louder. Now it's louder than the original. And now that's all you can hear. So it sounds just like the original signal, only it's a bit later. So exactly as the name implies, it's delaying the signal. Now, so far, all we've done is we've delayed the signal once, so there's just exactly one copy of it. Uh, if you can hear the original and the delayed version just once each, uh, two copies of the sound, uh, then that's what's known as a slapback. I think it's only really known as a slapback when a tape does it, but that's the kind of the, the name of that sort of uh, sound which can be uh, useful when applied to different things. Sometimes uh, a proper delay is just you know, a bit too much for the mix, so a single hit is uh, just what it needs. Uh, but what we can also do, uh, as with most delays, is we can add in a feedback loop here. This is the feedback knob. The output gets fed back into the input in a loop, and it just adds in another copy of the sound, which gets played again and again and again. So let's try that. And already it starts to sound interesting and fun. That uh, in itself is uh, a good way of cheating chords out of a monophonic synthesizer. So if it can only play uh, one sound at a time, this can make it sound as if it's playing a whole chord at once, even though it can't do that. As with uh, a plug-in or, or any other kind of delay, uh, you're quite welcome to uh, make a copy of the original waveform in your door and then just have only the, uh, the wet version, the, the version that's been through the processor, uh, without the dry version, the original version of the signal. Uh, and if you do that, so the wet version and the dry version are completely separate, then you can pan the original and the mixed version uh, to different areas in the mix, which I like to do. 
So I have the dry version, so you panned all the way on the left, and I then have the wet version on a separate channel, panned all the way to the right. And that way it uh, kind of fills up the mix a bit more. It still sounds like the uh, that particular part is mostly on one channel, but it does have this interesting stereo effect. So let's uh, take the feedback off again for a short while. So it's just two copies of the sound, the original and one copy of it. And if I uh, make the sound actually last longer, so it's sustained, let's hear what it sounds like then. Okay, that sounds kind of weird, but ultimately quite boring. But this thing here uh, is, let's see, this button here is the uh, the time it takes for the signal to pop out the other end. So we can make it a, a short delay. Actually, it's easier for me to show you if I go back to uh, the staccato one. Okay, so two of them there. We can make it take uh, less time to delay or longer 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 and at this point you have to ignore this nasty sound <laughs> longer and it really starts to not sound that good at that point but we can change how long it takes to delay which is important because if we then change it uh, back to a sustained sound sure this sounds pretty dull it's just two copies of the same sound But depending on how long the delay takes, um, what happens is, uh, I talked in the previous video about how sounds have harmonics. So each particular sound is made up of essentially lots of different sine waves. And when you play different sine waves at the same frequency, they can either make each other uh, louder or quieter they sound like one sine wave but louder or quieter as uh, they kind of interfere with each other depending on whether they're starting at the same point or not so by changing the delay length we're changing which sine waves get louder and which get quieter which really fundamentally changes the sound none of which you need to really understand right now we need to know is by changing the amount of time the delay takes uh, you can make uh, the sounds kind of sound quite different and where it gets interesting is if you change the amount of time the delay takes while you're playing the sound so it's worth noting that uh, it only really sounds interesting while you're changing the uh, amount of delay that it has and also that the faster you do it the more out of tune it sounds because when you change the delay sound uh, you're changing let's see you're changing the frequency it samples the sound at and when you slow it down just like slowing down a tape it slows down all of the sounds when you speed it up it, it makes the sounds higher you slow it down it makes the sounds lower in pitch so by changing the uh, the delay amount it changes the pitch and the faster you slow it down the lower the pitch goes the faster you speed it up the higher the pitch goes so this will be uh, nice and subtle this will sound terrible if we do it quickly and uh, any guitarist may notice that this starts to sound a bit familiar because uh, this is basically uh, what a guitar pedal does if it's uh, a chorus flange phaser type guitar pedal it does this sort of thing I think I need to zoom out a bit to show a bit more of that next. Okay, so this is the patch we got set up. Uh, there's a step acid just off camera up here. Uh, CV is going to an oscillator. The gate is going to an envelope generator. And so the sawtooth wave uh, is audible when I press the button, basically. Just off camera, I'm afraid. 
As I was saying, guitar pedals uh, tend to automate this with an LFO, so let's do that. Uh, I have an LFO here, so let's uh, connect a triangle output from that LFO to the input on the clock. Okay, with traditional dope for style, I believe this CV1 will just affect things the most amount and CV2, you can change how much it's affecting it using this CV2 knob here. So this means I can affect uh, how long the delay lasts, not at all, quite a bit, bit more, bit more, bit more, and so on. Let's try this uh, down an octave, that'll sound a bit nicer. There you go, nice one for bass lines. Um, you may also notice uh, that this sounds a suspicious amount uh, like pulse width modulation, uh, which is because pulse width modulation with its um, pulse wave that changes length, uh, changes the, the width of it, uh, is actually the same kind of thing as two sawtooth waves at a very slightly different pitch playing at the same time and when we're changing uh, the delay time it's the same kind of thing as changing the pulse width which is the same kind of thing as changing uh, how far apart in tuning the two sawtooth waves are which is how you can sort of make a, a pulse width wave, which um, again, you don't need to know anything about any of that, but you might be interested to know that when you've got a, a chorus uh, phaser flanger type guitar pedal, it's got a little LFO inside, I'm guessing triangle, uh, which then connects to uh, the clock of whatever's uh, delaying the signal in the case of the old ones, BBD, and that's how you get this kind of a sound. And if you can change how much uh, the uh, delay time uh, is changed by the LFO, then you've got a knob like this one on the pedal. Although with the guitar it doesn't have an infinite sustain, so it sounds a bit more like this. And you can change uh, with the LFO uh, the speed, the frequency of the LFO, which will change the frequency that the delay is changing at, which will make it sound more out of tune. So it gets into kind of honky tonk territory. So you can use a BBD as uh, a chorus flanger phaser type uh, effects device, as well as using it for slapback, as well as using it for a regular delay uh, with a feedback loop. So it really is quite versatile. Uh, but it can do what a guitar pedal can't, namely, uh, with the guitar pedal, it's, it's just got the one LFO inside it, but this is a modular synthesizer. So instead of having an LFO in it, uh, we could use uh, an ADSR envelope generator. Uh, now you may be wondering, you know, what's the point, why? Well, uh, notice when this gets to the peak, uh, it stops making the uh, decay time shorter and starts making it longer again. Then when it gets to the uh, trough, I guess, uh, the opposite of the peak, it stops making the delay time longer and starts making it shorter again. So it gets longer, 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 shorter, shorter, shorter. So let's just listen to it for a second. Notice how when it stops going in one direction, starts going the other direction, it will uh, sound like instead of being uh, higher in pitch, it's only lower in pitch or vice versa. Oh, let's make it a sustainy one. 
Okay. So when this LED here is at its brightest and when it's at its dimmest, you can hear there's a kind of change there. Maybe we don't want to hear that, in which case, instead of using an LFO to change the delay length, we can use the same ADSR envelope generator that's outputting the note. Right, so first of all, with the delay but with shorter notes, we can have this. So we still have this issue. Not necessarily an issue for you know, a particular patch, but in some instances you might not want to hear the, the very peak there. So just wire it up to the envelope generator. And no matter how many times you press the note, it's always starting from the same point and finishing at the same point. If you make the volume change uh, slower, you also make the delay length change slower. which also means the quicker it is, the more out of tune it sounds. Another thing that you can do with uh, a modular synthesizer that you can't do with the guitar pedal is even if you are using an LFO, you can synchronize it with the tempo of the song. So even if you do want to hear the, the peaks and the troughs, you can hear them in time with the music, which is a nice uh, thing to be able to do. Also, you can change the shape, but usually you don't want to. I think triangle wave is usually the, the most sensible sounding of the options. Now, uh, something you may have noticed earlier is that the signal that comes out does not sound as good as the one going in. And there's several reasons for that, so let's get to those. With a short delay length, it sounds pretty normal. It's kind of hard to tell the two uh, notes apart, I think. The original and the copy. Oh, but at this point, it's pretty obvious that the, the second one you hear doesn't sound as good as the first. And at this point you can hear the high-pitched whine. And at this point it's not in the same pitch. Okay, so what the hell's going on? A few things. <laughs> uh, first of all, um, there's a bit of a noise flaw on here, which is probably the least of its issues, but just like with tape, uh, there is a, a background hiss because, you know, it's not perfect. Everything has kind of entropy in the universe and BBDs are not the, the best things in the world for high fidelity. So background noise is something you have to live with with these. Second thing to talk about is the sample rate, uh, which makes it sound as if it's digital, which it, it really isn't, but it's kind of complicated. Hi, hopefully I'm not too big. Okay, so with a digital sampler, you digitize the waveform uh, every uh, few um, thousandths of a second. Uh, you will see which position the speaker's in, make a note, assign a number to that position, and you'll file it in your memory banks for later. So when you play it back, uh, uh, to set frequency, say about 40,000 times a second, you'll say, where should the speaker be here? In this position, here's the number, we'll move it to there. Uh, next time, where's it supposed to be now? Okay, we'll look up the number, we'll move it to there. And so with a digital sampler, uh, both how often you're sampling the position of the speaker and uh, what number you're assigning as a value to where the speaker is, those are both digital. Uh, they're both uh, discrete, there's no kind of smooth kind of curve there. Uh, we wait a, a set amount of time and then we assign it one of a number of positions. To be fair, uh, once you play back the, uh, the sample, if it's a good sampler, it will have a low pass filter which will take out 
uh, any of the uh, the nonsense side effects, high frequency sounds you don't want, and it does make the, the sounds coming out smooth again. So audio files don't despair. Uh, if it has a low pass filter uh, coming back out again, then you won't hear any side effects. It won't make stepping kind of motions. Uh, if it doesn't have one, then you're stuffed and, and it will sound quite bad. But then that's what we call digital crunch and maybe you want that. So that's digital samplers, but this is analog. So what's going on there? Well, in terms of uh, what position the speaker's in, that is completely analog, it's continuous. It doesn't assign a, a number to it. It doesn't say, well, we only care about several thousand different positions from there to there and, and we're going to assign it one of those. No, it will work out exactly where the speaker is and move it to exactly that position quite continuously. That's great. Uh, so as far as the physical position is concerned, it's analog. But as far as the uh, how often it checks part of it is concerned, that's kind of equivalent to digital. As far as how often it checks where the speaker should be, it will do it a set number of times every second and what dictates that number is this knob here. That's the, uh, the delay uh, length. And when you're changing this knob, what you're actually doing is changing how long to wait before you get each capacitor to pass the bucket along to the next one in the chain. So if you make them do it very quickly, uh, it's a very short delay time. If you do it very slowly, so each one looks after the charge for a while before passing it on, uh, then it will be a much uh, longer delay length. The thing is, they're not really that good at holding their charge, I think is what's happening there at the electronics level, where I'm not really that up on it. But all you need to know for using one is the longer you try and get the capacitors to hold their charge, the worse they're going to be at their job. So the practical offshoot there, the practical result, is that the longer the delay time the worse it's going to sound because it's a lower sample rate you're going to lose any high frequencies it's just not going to capture the uh, speaker position that often to catch the high frequencies and the lower ones are just going to turn to mush anyway because the capacitors can't really be expected to hold their charge that long i think so um the longer the delay time the worse it sounds so that explains why the sound gets all crunchy and changes pitch and just generally turns to mush. It doesn't explain this whine. What's up with that? So that sound, and I'm not sure if it's just dope for BBDs, but <laughs> what that sound is, uh, when you tell it to, um, hey, all of the capacitors, empty discharge, move on to the next one, you need to send a signal to tell them to do that. That's the signal. Each time you tell the capacitors to uh, pass the sound along to the next one, you give them a pulse to tell them to do that. And when you do that slowly enough, say less than 20,000 times a second, it's slow enough that you can hear it. And I believe with most BBDs what happens is uh, that clock signal will have a, a notch filter or a low pass filter afterwards so that you won't ever hear it. Not this one because this is a, a really kind of cheap uh, and basic one. Uh, it's actually one of the things I like about Dopefer's modulars generally is they tend to be a bit kind of cheap and cheerful and imprecise and they have so much character, uh, bags of character but in the case of the BBD, it may occasionally be going a bit too far because, you know, clients might complain about that. Uh, so that's what that wine is. But the fun thing with feedback loops is now that that's audible and that's actually coming out of here, it then goes back into the loop. So you can actually play around with just this one module and nothing else as long as you want it to sound weird and not at all like a tune. So if we put in our feedback loop, and dip this down for a second, we can kind of play around with the clock source itself and get this module to delete itself. If I can do it right. Whoa.
now you have to be quite careful with uh, a feedback loop because if you're not that careful uh, then with each iteration of the loop it gets louder instead of quieter and then you can't stop it and you have to very quickly lower this knob before it really hurts your ears also changing the, the clock rate to change the pitch slash speed that, that can uh, help if you don't keep it in the same position then usually uh, it helps the sound kind of fade away but you can have all kinds of crazy fun with this I mean, it works better if you actually put a sound in. <laughs> so if we just make it a little more sensible. play with this all day. All I'm doing is uh, at the top left I'm just playing the occasional new note just to give it something else to play with and just change the delay length and nothing else. Without the BBD I'm, I'm literally just doing this. I guess I could play uh, a few different notes. so much fun playing with this. I think basically with, with this kind of module it pretty much instantly sounds like Didio Derbyshire or Raymond Scott. Uh, I think electronic artists in the 50s and 60s and at the, the very beginning of starting to make instruments which are more or less designed to be uh, synthesizers rather than being repurposed World War II equipment and the like. Uh, that kind of very early electronic music era you'd hear quite a few uh, VBD type sounds. It's a really weird esoteric module and it could do quite a few things like your, your chorus and flanging type sounds and your delay and reverb type sounds and just weird sound effects you can sprinkle over the top but um, yeah I, I think it's probably a, a bit intimidating because of all these knobs here but for the most part um, you can ignore them uh, you know it's, for this you know you turn these all I remember is you, you flick these two to actually get it to do anything and, and then you use this one to change the to automate changing the delay time that's most of what you probably would do with this day to day um, and another interesting thing that I'd like to show you uh, looking at it now is the uh, FB feedback we've actually got an output and an input for the feedback loop itself which means we can send the sound away to a different module and back again or to a number of different modules and back again for each iteration of the loop this is good. I keep on trying to find uh, a tape delay because they're higher fidelity and the delay can be much longer. Uh, that has a feedback loop in it and it's really difficult to find ones that do so this is nice to have. Plus there's no moving parts so this doesn't break. Um, but yeah let, let's uh, try putting things in the feedback loop that'll be fun. So this is the patch I got set up with stepper acid at the very top. Very straightforward patch. So we're just making a sawtooth wave which then gets sent to this uh, BBD as a nice uh, delay effect. Now let's try putting a filter in the feedback loop and hear how that sounds. Ah, oh, you can just about hear it. So, okay, so with, uh, with this all the way up you can hear all the frequencies 
uh, are still represented in each version of the loop. But as we start to turn this down a bit, it has a dampening effect, so the higher frequencies are diminished with each version of the loop. So it kind of gets a bit more muffled with each iteration. I think you can hear it there. And by this point you can hardly hear it looping at all. And we can emphasise the uh, the cut-off point where it draws the line between which frequencies are included and which aren't. But that gets dangerous quickly. <laughs> So fun. And again, this is more stuff that, on its own, doesn't really doesn't really sound that useful. Uh, but it's something that you can sprinkle over the top of a mix to make it sound all kind of weird and alien. So uh, emphasising some frequencies more than others in each iteration of the loop. And where we draw the line, we're really making those frequencies in particular louder to the point where we're getting some pretty serious feedback that we're just playing with. And by sweeping it around, it gets kind of tolerable and keeps on changing. If we leave it pot, it's just going to make a really hideous racket. pretty important to keep it moving so it doesn't go too much overboard and you can play with the, uh, the delay length at the same time and this is probably the point where a few people might decide, I might want a BBD because, you know, it's fun to have all these weird alien sounds. Like I'm sure there's some kind of subgenre of dark noise ambient music that is just kind of this. <laughs> Probably enough of that. <laughs> now, uh, there's two people, I'm probably going to get their names wrong, but there's two people who I believe are called Carplus and Strong who figured out that when it comes to the uh, delay time uh, in the feedback loop, uh, that itself is a frequency and that becomes kind of the frequency of the pitch. Uh, and that's a whole other form of synthesis that I think no one really talks about, car plus strong synthesis. So uh, as the initial sound, instead of like a sawtooth wave, uh, we could use just some white noise as we'll make it really short. So this is just a brief burst of noise. And we turn on the BBD shenanigans. quite that extent. I'm going to turn this up a bit. Again. So now you can hear the brief burst of white noise uh, gets looped a whole bunch of times. And because the delay, not decay, delay, because the delay time is uh, so short, uh, it could probably say, you know, what frequency it's at, and it's an audible frequency, so it's a pitch. And you can change the pitch by changing the delay length. And it's kind of like exciting a string, like a guitar string or piano string. So with just a brief burst of noise to initially excite it, 
and then the feedback loops uh, delay time dictating the pitch you can make pitch sounds without having to use an oscillator there's a specific FX swing track that does that I think anyway so if you wanted to do a deep dive on that, uh, look into Car Plus Strong Synthesis and they worked out this whole method of synthesis based on this, uh, which I don't think really that many people talk about, but there you go. You can kind of emulate a string with just a feedback loop. So that's uh, a few things about uh, the Bucket Brigade device. So hopefully you now know whether you, know, you like them or not. And uh, yeah, it's a nice fun little chat. Uh, this is sponsored by my patrons, so thank you to those, especially the people you see on the screen now. I'm sure I've superimposed them up, up there somewhere. Um, thank you in particular, and, and, and thank you to everyone who watched me. I'm Zoe Blade, good night.